In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Direct, O Lord, all our actions by thy holy inspirations, and carry them on by thy gracious assistance, so that every prayer and work of ours may begin from thee, and by thee be happily added through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Um, today's conference is actually going to be on perfection. You know, yesterday I mentioned that Christ said, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And St. Paul also makes reference to being perfect. So the question, there's two questions that come to it is, first is, what does that perfection look like? The second part of it is, is things that have to be avoided in the process of becoming perfect. And there's certain things that people can misconstrue for perfection. Um, and the uh, and so we want to talk about a little bit about that. All the saints say that perfection consists in two parts. The first is what they call excellence in grace. And by excellence in grace, this basically means Saint Paul talks about how we participate in the divine trinity when God dwells in us um, in, our, in our human nature he comes and he creates into us a created participation in his nature and he talks about uh, he talks about that and how um, this it's because of that participation in his nature which is why it's obviously we don't become God but we participate in his nature in some way and he says that becomes the foundation for all the discussion in the whole of the Bible about us, our inheritance and in relationship to God. That originally Adam and Eve were created with this um, dwelling, it's called sanctifying grace. Grace just means something that makes us pleasing to God, what makes God pleasing is himself because he's all good. And so we become... Uh, pleasing to him when we are good in some way, that is, in uh, relationship to when we become like him. But if you look at, even from the Old Testament all the way on, they talk about the inheritance from God. And what happened is, is Adam and Eve were created in the state of grace that is being pleasing to God. And then what happened is, is at the fall, they lost that. And then God came back. They call it the Proto-Evangelium, which just means that it's kind of like the first gospel. They, they basically um, <clears throat> talked about how uh, he said to Satan, no, put enmity between your seed and her seed, referring to the fact that it was the first prediction of the coming of the Messiah. So they say, the fathers of the church say that in the Old Testament, as long as the Jews believed or the people believed in the upcoming Messiah, that was the foundation for their salvation. This is one of the reasons why um, the saints say that everybody's, everybody's salvation, even the angels, <clears throat> hinges upon Christ. So, but the point being in all this is that we become pleasing to God by this participation. So what's this excellence? It means that this excellency, excellence, sorry. Uh, excellence is, uh, means you have a lot of it, right? That you have a lot of it. And so this participation in God's um, nature is by degree, we get more and more and more of it. And we know this, we have a general sense for when Certain people are just a little holier than the rest of us, and holiness just means sacred, that is, the person is pleasing to God. And so that's what we want to strive for, is this excellence and grace to get a lot of it. But then the question, and so it's in the soul, um, St. Thomas says it's a quality, it changes us qualitatively in the eyes of God. And so this is important. Um, it's not just a way that God looks at us, it's an actual real change in us. Okay, now, back up just a little bit. All of us want to be perfect. It's, a, it's something that God put in, a, in our human nature. We all want to be perfect. None of us want are the defects that we have or the imperfections that we have. Um, sometimes people will get to the point where they become comfortable with their defects because it's just they feel it's just too hard to achieve this perfection to get rid of these disorders that they have within themselves. That they that they've picked up along the way, either because of their own sin or because of the, just the disorders that we suffer from as human beings after Adam and Eve ate the fruit. But the point is, is that all of us have a natural inclination to reach perfection or to be perfect. The problem is, this is one of those natural imperfections, that's, that's one of those natural inclinations that nature doesn't suffice for us to achieve it. 
for, let me back up just a bit. There's certain kinds of inclinations that we have that we can just achieve on our own. We have a natural inclination to marriage, so you can go and get married and achieve that on your own. You don't need um, God in order to get married, although your marriage should have God as part of the process if it's going to be pleasing to him. I'm just saying that on a natural level, you can achieve marriage without um, additional help with God. Obviously, even everything that we do on a physical level, because he keeps us in existence and gives us even the ability to perform the actions that we perform, that uh, in that sense God helps us. But we're talking just on a natural level. He helps us on a natural level. That's different from grace, which is on a supernatural level, because grace, because it's the sanctifying grace that is this participation in him, is an indwelling in us. That is, it's his part. He comes and takes up his, we become a temple of God. That's why that whole thing of the temple of the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit comes and takes up his residence in us. That's basically what that means. And this originally occurred, normally this occurs right when people are baptized, when they're baptized. That's when they first get that, um, normally. Sometimes they can get it actually before that, but that's a bit of a complication. The point being in all this is that we, we get to participate in his divine nature, but there's another kind of grace in which God helps us to do things that we couldn't achieve on our own um, and that they're above nature. So, for example... Faith, which is to give assent to the truth that God has revealed. So when we read scripture, we know the truth of what's in there. We know it's true because God gives us the faith to see that this is true. That ability to do that is above nature because what's being revealed is above our human nature. And so as a result, God has to give us a little bit of extra help in order to do that. And that's called actual grace. That's the grace that God gives us to perform certain kinds of actions. Okay. Why is that distinction important between what this... His participator, where he indwells in us, and then his help. Well, the point is, is that uh, you can't even really maintain that him being pleased with you without his help long term, because we all know, as human beings, we have a proclivity where we're going to end up doing some really bad stuff pretty quickly if we don't, um, which means we'll fall out of God's favor. We're going to do some really bad things pretty quickly if he doesn't help us to, to do the right things. But this also means that our perfection can only be achieved with his help. One of the biggest mistakes I see, especially among Catholics, is this idea that I have to do everything I possibly can to render my soul in a state of perfection before I give it to God. Sorry, it cannot be done. In fact, that's heretical. The reason being is, is because your perfection of a human being is above and beyond our nature to accomplish. The church has been very clear about this. This is why, at a certain point, God has, we have to cede control over our spiritual life and our interior life and our interior development to reach this perfection to Him. And if we don't do that, if we maintain control, we will always be imperfect. Always. Now, it doesn't mean that we don't take reasonable means to overcome our imperfections. We'll talk about that in a little bit. It just means that, at a certain point, we have to just cede control to God. I tell people, look, we're like little kids in diapers. We've made this mess in our diaper. The one-year-old kid can't change his diaper. He's incapable of it. So our souls are like these diapers. We've made a mess of them, and God has to come and clean up the diaper, so to speak. And that's an important thing to kind of keep in mind. Now, there's two extremes to avoid in that. As I mentioned, the first is... I will eradicate all my imperfections. It cannot be done. You have to just cede control over to God. And like I said, the more you try and control your spiritual life and your interior development, the less you will advance spiritually. And we'll talk about why that is in a bit. The second side of it is the fact that um, people will uh, do nothing to overcome their imperfections and just sit, just sit there and say, Oh okay, God, you just do it all. No, that's not exactly how it works either. This grace that God gives us that helps us, that inclines us to do things, like it inclines us like, you know, I should pray right now, or I should go read the Bible, or I should go, you know, study my catechism, or I should do something so that I understand more about God, or, you know, or you'll see certain, um, even on a day-to-day -day basis, sometimes God will give us a grace just to fulfill our duties so that we become better in that area. And so what that means is we have to be faithful to those graces that God sends us, so when I get the inclination to pray... I shouldn't just say, oh, well, no, I don't want to do that. I'm going to go watch TV. That's the danger that can, people can kind of fall into. 
to where they become kind of comfortable because if they're leading fairly decent moral lives where they're not killing people and shooting people at, you know, and all this, people think, well, I'm not that bad of an individual. They become comfortable and thinking they're, uh, they're okay. The problem is, is that God, in addition to being merciful, God's justice requires Christ to be perfect. This was a commandment. Be perfect. He didn't say try to be perfect. He said be perfect. Now, what that means is, is that uh, you're going to have to uh, cede control over to him if you're going to achieve that. That means that our job is to cooperate with those graces that he gives us so that we attain that perfection. And by cooper cooperation means not in control. It just means that when he, but it does, doesn't mean that you don't just sit there and not cooperate and just assume he's going to do everything. I'm sure you've heard that joke where this guy's sitting on the top of a roof, on the top of a, um, uh, uh, his house and it's flooded and all the way up to the, just to the top of his house and he's standing there. And a guy comes by in a boat and says, um, hey, you know, you want off the house? Look, we can get you on the house. He says, no, 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 I'm going to trust in God that he's going to rescue me, right? And so then he goes off. And then the next thing, a helicopter comes by and says, hey, we're going to get you off your roof because it's, it's flooding, right? And it's, the water's raising, right? And he says, no, 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 I'm going to trust in God that he's going to help me. Then what happens is, is, is the guy drowns because it gets up above his head and he can't swim. And so he drowns. And he's standing before God and he says, why didn't you save me? He says, what are you talking about? I sent you a boat and a helicopter. Okay, the point being is, is that God provides us help so that we'll actually achieve this, but we, don't, we just don't presume that he's going to do everything. There was a, that term, has it, it, the actual term for that is pietism. And, and sometimes it's also called quietism. It just depends on its flavor. That's the ones in which you just sit there and then God is going to do everything. That is just completely false. We just have to cooperate with him. Now... What does this... Okay, so excellence and grace. You have to have a lot of that grace. And that means you have to cooperate. And he gives you the inclination to overcome your defects. So the next so then the next thing is the defects. We have to get rid of them. Now, there's different kinds of defects. There's physical defects, you know, like, say, the fact that I'm growing bald. That is not a moral defect. So you don't have to worry about the fact that you're growing bald, and you shouldn't be worrying about the fact that you're growing bald. St. Thomas makes a very interesting statement. When he said this, I spent, I've spent years contemplating this, this, what this statement means and just observing it in people. He says, sinners are worried about the exterior man. In other words, they're worried about how they appear to people, how they look, their physical appearance, whether they're in perfect shape or not, all those kinds of things. That's what they worry about, sinners, he says. He says, whereas the holy worry about the interior man. Now, that doesn't mean they don't take reasonable care of their appearance and things of that sort, but they do it for the sake of, um, you know, charity to other people and also to, um, to maintain virtue and things of that sort. But they're more interested in their own virtue. Why is that important? It's important because there is a thing called perfectionism. And what perfectionism is, is it's a form of thinking that, um, well, there's two parts of it. One, that I can attain perfection on my own. But the second part of it is that I, I, I am looking for perfection in myself in such a way that I exclude God from the process. But also, the saints talk about how this perfectionism is very often concerned about externals, things outside of him. What does that mean concretely? Well, there was this one nun one time who wrote a letter to, um, to Pod I think it was Padre Pio, either that was John of the Cross, I can't remember which one it was, and he, she said, you know, I would be a lot holier nun, I would be perfect, basically, is what she was saying, if it wasn't for all these other nuns in the convent. <laughs> uh, and he wrote back and he said, oh no. He says, it's their imperfections that are the means of you becoming holy. And what does that ultimately mean? Well, perfectionism looks to have this, it's this idea that if everything external to me is perfect, then I can reach a state of perfection and then I'll be at peace. What that translates into is expecting everyone else around me to be perfect as well. And so it concretely turns out to be where the person will intervene in people's lives. Now here we're not talking about the raising of children. 
where, you know, before the age of six or seven, you have to kind of stop them from running out in front of the car, and you have to stop them from beating the, the, you know, Johnny next to him. You have to stop them, right? But there comes a certain point when children start getting older, you can't be intervening all the time because what you're doing is you're stunting their spiritual growth because you're keeping them at the stage of a, of a child. You have, to lead, you have to get to the point where it's just counsel now, and you have to just let them. But the person who seeks perfectionism is not, he's looking externally to himself, ultimately, rather than seeking the perfection which is interior. And what's that interior perfection look like? It is virtue, good habits in all areas. Now, there's 64 virtues. I doubt there's anyone here who can rattle them all off. Okay. But there's 64 virtues like prudence, temperance, justice, fortitude, faith, hope, and charity are part of it, etc. Um, there's, but these virtues are what perfects your soul. Because Aristotle said, virtue does two things. It inclines you to the good, to the good of the thing, to do, to do a good work. So it helps me to be inclined towards, it's a habit, so it helps me to do the good thing. So, and you can see this, when people finally get a habit developed, they get to the point where they can quickly do it. The second thing is, he says, it renders the faculties that it, this virtue is in, it renders the soul itself good. It makes us good. And we know this generally, like we will say when we, we see someone who's a, who's a virtuous individual, it's like he's a good man, right? Not just that he, we don't say he always does good things, we say he is a good man. And that's what virtue does, it makes us good. The problem with perfectionism is it doesn't really strive after virtue because its focus is on everything external to the individual, even in themselves, where they're more worried about, you know, I keep doing this, I keep doing that, I keep doing this, I keep doing that, there's something wrong. Okay, look it. You're still focusing on something external. You have to look at what is the, de what, what is the, what is, where's the lack of virtue here? You've got to look to yourself. And with the nun, and one of the, with the nun, she said, I'd be a holy virtue. She said, oh, no, that's the means of becoming holy. Why? It's other people's imperfections that will tell us where our lack of virtue is. So, for example, there was a nun, uh, St. Therese, and she said that, you know, when she was sitting in choir, there's this one nun who kept making this clicking noise all the time. And it over out of her mind. And so what she did is she started, she decided, you know, I'm going to get to the point where I enjoy that, that clicking sound. And after a while, she got to enjoying it, right? What that basically means is, is that the virtue, the lack of virtue will show itself by our emotional reactions to what other people do. So if a person has perfect virtue, they don't, it, they're not focused on what other people are doing. They're only focused on God, ultimately, and then themselves in relationship to God and whether they're achieving Him. They don't care the fact that, you know, so-and-so is, you know, eating too much chocolate or so-and-so is talking too much. They're not interested in that. The only time that they would go venture out to help the person is through charity, through love of God, because they want to see God manifest in all of creation. Whereas perfectionism wants to make sure everything around them is perfect. And even their own actions are always perfect. You know, let's just say for the sake of argument, you could do perfect actions all the time. It doesn't mean it proceeds from virtue. Okay. So one of the ways that, in fact, the term defect has another name. It's just called vice, which is the opposite of virtue. So if you react in anger to what someone does... It tells you you don't have the virtue of meekness, which is the virtue opposite of anger. It's the virtue in which the person doesn't go to extremes in their reactions in relationship to certain things. So when somebody says something, it doesn't affect them. And so that's one of the signs that they have the virtue of meekness, because they just don't get angry. Or they only get, their, their anger is only moderated to the degree that's necessary and, and, or that, that properly relates to the thing. Because anger intrinsically isn't bad. It's only bad when it's unmoderated. But most people, it's unmoderated. Now, here's the problem. When Eve looked at the... We, 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 it, this, Adam did the same thing. But it plays itself out in Scripture in, in discussing it with Eve. When Eve looked at the fruit, it said 
that her, because uh, she, when she looked at it, she said the fruit was pleasing to the sight. Now, what does that mean? Well, Satan had said to her, he says, you're not going to die. So he removed from her the inhibition to actually doing it. And he says, and besides, if you do this, you'll be like the gods. And so she looked at it, and it was pleasing to the sight, which meant what? Intellectually, she knew the precept, don't eat the fruit. She knew, because the fathers say, God told Adam, don't eat the fruit. And then Adam told her, uh, don't eat this fruit. God said, don't eat this fruit. Okay. So she knew intellectually, she's not supposed to eat the fruit. But emotionally, when she was looking at it, she started taking emotional delight in the, in the idea of the fruit. And so when she ate the apple, what happened was her emotions stopped being subordinated to her reason. And now we have these emotions that are all over the map. If you have an emotion that isn't subordinated to reason, in fact, the, type, the name for that is called antecedent appetite. If your emotion occurs before reason or contrary to reason and will. You don't want this thing. You know it's wrong, but it's still there. That's a sign that you have a disordered emotion. That is a sign of a defect. There's something lacking. What this tells you is the opposite. As you grow in virtue, your emotions will never move until reason says to move. In other words, they'll become completely subordinated to reason. That's the beauty that God created Adam and Eve in. Now, they lost what's called the gift of integrity, which kept everything in order in themselves when they ate the fruit. But now what takes the place of that gift is virtue. As we develop the virtues in all the areas, our emotional life calms down and becomes perfectly subordinated to reason. It just doesn't move. This is why you can be around someone, they can say something insulting, and it doesn't efface you. Okay. The point being is that if you see any emotion that arises up that you don't want or you realize is disordered, that you don't have full control over, that's a sign of a vice in that area. So you just look at it and say, okay, I'm getting angry. I have to work on meekness. You know, I see the chocolate and I start losing rationality and I have to go eat the chocolate. Okay, that tells me I don't have temperance, at least in relationship to chocolate. Okay. But the point in all this is, is that the virtue, having all this virtue, then why does God love virtue? Why does he want it? The reason he wants it is because virtue is the habit of always doing the good. Which means that he wants you to have all of the virtues so that you're always in the habit of doing the good. When you die, there's only two things you take with you. Well, three technically. The first is this grace that's in your soul that makes you pleasing to him. Or the lack of it. The second is your virtues and vices, because those are in the soul, because it's the soul operating through the body, and that's, that's um, where it functions. So it's this virtue that takes you with it. Now, why does God want you to die with all the virtue? Because in heaven, if people are going to be around each other and never fight, and it's going to be a state of eternal happiness, which he says it is, people cannot have any of the vices, any of them. So before they get to heaven, they have to have all the virtues so that their common life together in God is a happy one. So he wants you to achieve this. But it also means that because you're doing virtue, he means you know, he knows you will always do everything for the love of him. He knows that you will never do anything out of anger and hurt people. He knows that you're not going to um, do things contrary to his Ten Commandments. He knows this because you've attained a certain level of virtue. So then, back to the problem of perfectionism. The problem with perfectionism is it confuses that interior right order with an external right order of everything being externally to me that's, that's, in, that's rightly ordered, that everything externally to me. I always tell people the irony of it is to obtain true perfection, to attain true virtue, you have to be detached from all the imperfections that you see outside of yourself. And by detached, I mean, they don't bother you. You can let loose of it. And if there's anything external to you that irritates you, annoys you, you know there's something you're attached to and you've got to let loose of it. For your sake, for your own virtue's sake. This also means that you have to be careful not to be constantly intervening or controlling, trying to control things outside of the individual. In fact, trying to control things outside of yourself is an inherent sign of lack of self-control. This is the irony of it. 
you look at the people in government, they're constantly trying to control everything that we do because they themselves don't have control of themselves. They don't have control of the fact that they want to control other people, at least. But there's other areas, too, that they obviously have issues. The point being is, is that if we're trying to control those things externally to us, rather than making sure that our own virtue is uh, where it's supposed to be, and then from there we can pray and do those things to help people, but not trying to control it. And this becomes particularly important in families, because what can happen is, uh, I call it uh, um, unrestrained motherhood. And basically what it is, is mothers have a natural inclination to want to protect their children and make them perfect. It's wonderful. The problem is it gets immoderated. So when the kid's about 15, 16 years old, I see this all the time among traditional Catholics, where the mother is so paranoid that the kid is going to go off and commit some act of impurity or do some other thing that he's not supposed to do. He's going to get to the stage where he's 18 years old and there's some area of his life that he lacks virtue that they literally control every single thing the kid does. And then the kid gets to be 18 and he's a mess because he's not, he hasn't grown up. Okay, this is one of the areas where you have to be careful of that because that's a form of perfectionism. But the other side of it is making, thinking, okay, I can do everything and perfect everything on my own. There's a flip side to this. There's a little bit of thing in here in this perfectionism too. When you think that you can perfect yourself rather than asking Christ to perfect you and, have, and just cooperating with it when he works through you. When you try and control it yourself, there's a little thing sitting in the background other than gargantuan pride, because you think you're so, I mean, you literally think you're God that you can perfect yourself. The other side of it, though, is there's something lurking in the background. Our perfections are all, our, our imperfections are often our vices. A vice is the opposite of a virtue. A virtue is a good habit, and it takes time. You have to develop a habit. You have to perform it a lot of times in order to have that good habit. And then once you have it, it's very easy to maintain, and doing it is, is delightful. Vice is the opposite. Vice is also a habit. You have to do it for a while until you get into the habit of doing it, and then it becomes difficult to stop doing it, whereas virtue gives a certain a person freedom. You can either take it or leave it, like I was mentioning last night with the cigars. I can either take it or leave it. I mean, I enjoy cigars, but if I don't, if I don't get to smoke a cigar, it's not gonna kill me. And most, most doctors would agree with that. Okay, but the point is, is that, uh, that the vice is, that, you know, in English, the term vice means a, something that grips or holds on to something. And that's exactly what defects do. They kind of hold on to this. Okay, so back to my original point. So the person who has vices, it's because of bad habits that they've got into. They have done things that have offended God. And how do we know that? Virtue is perfecting our human nature. The Ten Commandments are just an expression of the natural law. It's how God designed us. So whenever we sin or violate the Ten Commandments, we develop vice. And any time we obey the Ten Commandments and do what we're supposed to do, then we develop virtue. So what happens is people develop these vices, and then what ends up happening is, is they look at the vice that causes them sadness, which is okay. But what they do is, is then they go into, they fall into that thing, oh, i got to get rid of this, i got to get rid of this. No, what you really need to do is turn to Christ and ask Him to get rid of it. Two things, this thing that's really lurking in the background, it's lack of self-forgiveness. A lot of times people will look at the evil things that they've done and they have a very hard time forgiving them. They might go to God and they know that God has forgiven them, but they themselves can't forgive themselves. That's very often what's in, lurking in the background. I have, I have to get rid of this thing. And it's kind of like, it's, it's what we do to other people that we're angry with. I gotta get rid of this guy's behavior. I gotta stop this behavior. And so anger and all sorts of disturbance and tyranny arises. No, what you need to do is when you see a defect in yourself, what you need to do is, one of the things that needs to happen is, you need to forgive yourself for your past sins. God, has forgiven you. If you don't forgive yourself, you are standing in judgment of God telling him that your forgiveness of this individual, happens to be yourself, is not worthy. Because you're still holding the sins that you, he has committed against him, against him, with that name yourself. You have to stop that. You have to forgive yourself. And realize the Council of Orange, or sorry, no, the Council of Trent, 
says that no man can stay out of mortal sin. That's seriously offending God, even for a short period of time without grace. The fact of the matter is, is that we're just dysfunctional as human beings after the fall. And when we get to heaven, we'll be rightly ordered because God will perfect us. But the point in, in all of this is, is that your falls and your things like that just tell you you're human beings. And that's one of the things that people that are laboring under these defects of original and actual sin. That's what people don't want to hear. They don't want to hear that because they have this inclination and they don't want to hear the fact that they're imperfect. So there's that. And so they tend to hold it against themselves. They've hurt themselves to some degree. The other thing is, too, is there's another name for uh, vice, and that is wound. Whenever we, our human nature is designed to perform acts of virtue, Thomas Aquinas says. And how do we know that? When we have virtue, our nature is free, we feel, we, we, we get delight in doing it, and we, we, there's a certain kind of peace and joy that goes with having the virtue. When we don't have virtue, and there's an area of our life that's dysfunctional, we're unsettled, we're unhappy, which tells you that it's contrary to our nature, because God designed our nature to function a certain way, and if it functions rightly, then we're at peace, right? Okay, so what that means is, is that you've wounded your nature somehow. What's a wound? Well, a wound is when a person, uh, let's just take a physical wound. A physical wound is you pierce, you like your hand, it gets pierced, and it gets cut, and there's damage that's caused. And because of the damage, two things rise. There's a weakness now. Because you're, when you're really hurting and a lot of pain because of the damage that's caused, you're not as strong when, you're full, then when you don't have that wound. And that's the same thing that's true in relationship to vices. And also in our past sins, they hurt us, they wound us, and cause us to be dysfunctional and disordered and weak. The second thing is they cause us pain. So that's when we look at our vices, they, you know, when we look at our imperfections, we're saddened by them. That's the pain. The book of Isaiah says, through his stripes we are healed. St. Paul says, through his wounds we are healed. And what that means is, is that Christ chose to allow himself to be physically flogged and to be physically pierced so that through that process he would merit what was necessary to heal our interior dysfunctions and disorders. That healing comes primarily through actual grace. That's the cooperation side. We can't, there's certain kinds of wounds that'll kind of heal on their own, but there's certain kinds of wounds that require a physician, St. Thomas says. And that physician, he says, has to come and put a certain kind of a medicine on it, and that's what grace is, to help us to get more rightly ordered. God can cure our vices, etc., through grace. We have to ask him for that, and that's where the participation is. When we don't forgive ourselves, what we are doing is we are holding the wound in place. That's what we're doing. We're holding it there. I'm not letting you off. You're going to hold on to this thing, and you're going to make it right, but you're holding on to the woundedness. You can't do that. You have to turn to Christ and say, look, I'm a mess. And you have to clean me up. You have to heal me through your wounds. You have to heal me of these dysfunctions and these disorders because then, then I will become perfect. People who have self-forgiveness, they let loose of all those sins that they've committed in the past, they forgive themselves. So let loose of it, so they let loose of it. And then turn to Christ and say, you perfect this, you heal this. And then they cooperate with that. Their advance in the spiritual life is drastically faster and much more at peace than it is when they try and suffer from this, controlling it themselves. Because they're just not going to be able to do it. And so this is something that's really important. You have to cede control over Christ in relationship to the development of your own spiritual life. You have to stop trying to control everybody outside of you. You have to stop trying to make everybody else perfect and worry about your own interior perfections. And then from that, because you're going to be more pleasing to God, when you go to ask him something, and he, God's no different from us in this respect, you know, if someone who we really like comes and asks us something, we're pretty quick to say yes, because we want to please them, because we love them. Whereas if we're not, if the person comes us and kind of like him, but you're not, but he asks us for something that's kind of big, we're like, well, maybe not. Whereas if someone who we really like comes and asks for something pretty big, say, well, okay, God is the same way. So the more we gain of this, the more we'll be able to help the people outside of ourselves. But that means, in order to achieve that, you have to let loose of trying to control everything outside of you. 
and the perfectionism. Now, back to this virtue. What's the relationship between this virtue and grace? We can increase, how do we get a lot of this participation in us? When somebody does something for us that we like, we become more pleased with it, and they keep doing it, we become more and more pleased with that person. It's the same thing with God. If we are already, if we're already pleasing to Him, and we perform a lot of acts of virtue, what happens is, is that He starts giving us more grace, and we become more pleasing to Him over the course of time. That's how you get a lot of this, is by performing acts of virtue. And that means you have to work on overcoming your vices. Now, there's one thing that should be observed. Teresa of Avila and John of the Cross, who are two mystics, um, said that there comes a certain stage in a person's spiritual life where you're doing things for virtue's sake, but eventually you start doing things purely for charity's sake. You do it only for the love of God. And you love your neighbor for, purely for God's sake. And so you're not doing it by any natural motivation. You're not doing the virtue just to get rid of your defects. You're doing it because you want your soul to be really pleasing to him. And all these virtues in your soul are like little gems in a crown. It makes it beautiful, right? It's what makes your soul beautiful. This grace and these virtues is what, <clears throat> is what makes your soul beautiful. But the point in all this is, is that the saints say that you can get to the point where there is, you don't have any vices and you have this excellence and grace, but on an exterior level, God will allow you to commit Faults. They're not necessarily sins, but to do things inadvertently or unreflective or unknowing that are, um, that are disordered. And he's, he, they said, it's not because there's something wrong with you in this area. Rather, St. Thomas says, and this is what they talk about, God allows people to fall into those little faults, even though they're not sins. He falls into those little faults, you know, doing things not quite perfectly, etc. For the sake of their humility... And for the sake of them continuing to maintain the virtue. Faith, hope, and charity, as long as we don't ever act against them, they, can always, in, they always increase. They never go down. But with, when it comes to the moral virtues, like temperance, because of our state in this life, we have to constantly work on them to maintain them. And we know this ourselves, that, for example, if I go and I get to the point where I'm 300 pounds and I'm just sitting on the couch not doing anything and I decide I want to... I want to be an Olympic athlete. Well, it ain't going to happen overnight. I have to get my body in condition, and I have to work it so that it, it, it adjusts itself so that, so that I get in shape. But then I can't just go back to sitting around because then my body goes back out of shape. So I have to keep maintaining it. The spiritual life is the same thing. I have to keep performing acts of virtue to maintain it. One of the things that can often happen is, is that temptations that come <clears throat> don't necessarily mean there's something wrong with you, although they might be that sometimes the temptations come in order to maintain that virtue. So sometimes guys will say, look, Father, I mastered chastity, and I don't know what the deal is, but now I'm starting to get the temptations again. Okay, there's no problem. It doesn't mean that you've lost your chastity. It just means that you have to shore that area up again in your life and, and keep it by practicing cuss of the eyes, not looking at women who are immodest, etc. So that just means that there's that part of it. And the, the difficulty is, is that the person who suffers from perfectionism, and I've seen this happen, they get disturbed when there is that external fault or there's that, that, uh, um, that temptation. They get disturbed because, uh-oh, something's not perfect here. No, what it just means is, is that, okay, you might have reached a certain level of perfection in this life, but it just means that God has to maintain it or he just wants more virtue in that area. God likes us to have virtue. And so that's why we have to do it. So... Again, St. Paul says, be, or uh, St. Paul talks about perfection with Christ, says, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And this is, the, this is what it looks like. Okay, any questions? Everyone's... Mm. I got two questions. I'm yeah. trying to relate this to some instances. One is, um, you have a condition where, let's say someone, you have a family that homeschools and that kind of thing. They don't want their kids... Even being around other, you know, Catholics or that kind of thing, because they see that fall. They see pretty perfections, yeah. Yeah, so they want to kind of just have their own little... Circle of the wagons. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to relate this to this perfect.
contracts are talking about is that. I mean, what is going on here? They think part of professionalism is if you remove every form of temptation and every form of difficulty from a person's life, they'll become perfect. That's just nonsense. Wow. And the way you know that is, you see these kids, they're their parents literally hardly let them go out of the house. They go off to college and the kid has no virtue. Why? Because he hasn't had to deal with other people's problems and develop the virtues that go along with, develop, with dealing people with like, like that. So they don't have the virtue. So the kid goes off and he doesn't have any virtue. Yeah, we've seen that. Yeah. And so what, that, what does that mean? It just means when kids are younger and you're developing their virtues, and, or they're, they're, you know, before kids are six or five or six, depending on the child, before they have the use of reason. Kids don't develop virtue. What they do is they develop a, a kind of a training like you do with a dog. <laughs> it's like one, one of the psychologists that um, I do a lot, a lot of consultation with because we're working on particular areas together. Um, he says, basically, kids before the age of three are little apes. Mm -hmm. You know, so... Um, and what happens is... is uh, before that age, that's when, that's when you have to kind of control them to a certain degree. But once they start making the use of reason, you have to start letting them develop their own virtue on their own. And then by the time they go through puberty at that stage, you should be to the point where if you've trained them properly and given them the proper formation, you should be to the point where it's just purely counsel. And because they have to make that transition, and it doesn't mean that they, they ignore and do whatever and they don't have to come and consult you. That's quite the contrary. It just means that when they, get, when they come across this stuff, they have to be able to process it. Now, it doesn't mean that before a kid is 18, that if you find him getting involved in stuff that gravely offends God, that you don't, okay, that's it, you got to stop, right? But that means, however, that you have to, there's some area that you didn't show up right. Or, uh, sometimes when people will look at things and they'll think, uh, my, that my kid has a grave defect and it's not a grave defect, right? So, you know, my daughter, she talks a lot. And so they basically put a muzzle on her and won't let her talk. Well, that's not helping her develop moderation. You know, the demons have a principle. Anything but in, anything, what does virtue do? Virtue is, it lies between excess and defect. Eating too much or too little, you eat just the right amount you're supposed to. Well, what can happen is, is that people can try and remove the two extremes thinking that the kid will automatically end up in the middle. That's not what's going to happen. The kid has to have exposure to the thing that causes the difficulty that as he gets older, in the more, in the earlier stages, you have to reframe it and then you more moderate it as they get older <clears throat> so that the virtues develop so that when he reaches 18, you don't have to worry about it. If he never has any exposure to any kind of like alcohol or anything under the household, you're going to have a problem, probably, not always, but a lot of the times, the kid's going to get into, uh, the kid is going to get into college, and he's just going to be a drunkard for a year and a half, because he's going to try to, hey, I like this, rather than realizing that, okay, I have to, you know, my parents taught me how to drink moderately, right? So, the point is, they have to have certain exposure to the thing in order to develop the virtue. If they have none, there is no virtue in the end, because why? Virtue is a, is a habit. In relationship to that object that they're struggling with. Well, if you take that away and they never have to struggle with it, then they don't develop the virtue. That's the difficulty with perfectionism. I can just remove all of the things that constitute a struggle. Now, I'm not suggesting that you bring evils into your home. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm just saying is, is that the kids have to have a moderated experience. Um, and by the time the kid is 18, you shouldn't have to be worrying about who he's talking about in, you know, in the ch in, at church or out in public. You, should be, you shouldn't have to worry about it. Because you should already have the virtue. Now, sometimes what that means is, though, is that if your kid has a real problem with something, you have to go more to the side of defect. It doesn't mean you completely remove it, because if you completely remove it, he's not going to develop the virtue. It just means that you have to get him, you have to kind of restrict it more until he can appropriate that restriction and then kind of moderate himself. But that also means that, again, he has to have some exposure to it, and then you, you uh, lighten up as time goes on. Because otherwise, if you don't do that, you're going to get the kid, and he's going to get in college, and then he's going to be all over the map. And we saw this, actually, in the seminary where I taught. This was a big problem we had. Guys were in homeschool, and kid, families that would come to the seminary, and they, it was the first time they experienced any kind of freedom, and they were just, by the, t by the end of the first year, just like, you got to go home. <laughs> and that, what that's a sign of is, you know, um, 
you know, remember when I was saying that Fulton Sheen said maturity comes through suffering and through responsibility, that responsibility is actually the development of virtue. That's why I said, you know, when it comes to difficult things, you have to take it on yourself. You can't just do it to get it done. You have to say, okay, I'm going to engage this thing and do it well. That's the, the, that's the volitional part of developing the virtue. And that has to be done within the home. Otherwise, you're going to end up with, you're going to end up when the kid gets to be 18, if he hasn't developed that virtue, he's going to be, he's going to have problems in that area. And that's what we're seeing. So. And I, by the way, I'm a big fan of homeschooling because I think that what's going on in the public school system today is atrocious. It just means that there has to be a certain, like in the, in the social arena, there has to be a certain exposure to kids to be in the social area so that they develop the virtues that go along with being that. While they're under you, not fortunately, you know, unfortunately much later. Okay. Yes? What's the Council of Orange? The Council of Orange? It's this little orange of that that sits over... No. Uh, the Council of Orange was a council that was done... That at the, the place is called Aristocone, which translates into English as orange. But it was a place... But basically, they met there and they dealt questions about grace. And that was one of the places where they said that God gives everybody sufficient grace to be saved. But they made it very clear that doesn't mean everybody is saved. So, okay. Yes? Yeah. If, uh, if you have a child who has an addicted behavior mm -hmm. to something, um, you need to take it away for a period of time. When do you introduce it back, and how do you do that? When um, do you determine it's time to start again, and how would you introduce it back? It depends on the, on the nature of it. If, if the nature of the thing is not grave, you shouldn't really take it away from them. If it is grave, then you have to take it away until he kind of starts demonstrating it. But that taking away, is, again, you have to be careful because if it becomes an ongoing thing and he doesn't develop the virtue, then we end up with that problem that I just mentioned. So normally, if it's not something that's grave, it's just an excess in some area, it just means that you have to more limit his exposure. And so um, it means that you might have to take it away just initially for like a week to a month. But if you go much more than, say, two or three months and he's not getting exposure to the thing and not developing the virtue, then uh, that can kind of become... Uh, then what happens is, is it's virtue in the absence of vice, in a sense. It's not true virtue. It's just that the guy's not exposed to it, so it looks like he's gaining the moderation. Now, he has to have a limited exposure to it. So what you do is, you just let him have a limited... and you just tell him... You will get more freedom in this area when you start developing, when you start demonstrating more and more control in this area. So that's what you have to see. You have to, he has to show virtue, which is what? Self-control in relationship to that thing. So you don't want it to go for an extended period of time. Um, there's all sorts of other psychological reasons, but one of them is if it goes for very long, what's going to end up happening is, is the person's just not going to develop virtue. So... It should, it, that, restri that complete restriction, that's why, you know, when I grew up, if you did something really stupid, you were grounded for like a week or a month or something. Um, you have to just kind of take it until, and part of that is just to get the person to realize, okay, look, it, you're doing something you shouldn't be doing. Um, but uh, at a certain point, he has to start developing the virtue. Sometimes that means sitting down with a kid and say, okay, look, this is how you're going to have to develop the virtue. You're going to have to voluntarily restrict yourself to, say, you know, um, like, let's just take the computer. You're going to have to restrict yourself to 20 minutes on the computer a day. Yourself. You have to do that. And as you do that, then we'll lighten up on the restrictions. If we see you're not doing it, we're going to keep maintaining that restriction until you get control over it and can demonstrate it. But it doesn't mean, again, you take it fully away. It just means you keep that restriction in place. And not, So in other words, you don't take it entirely away. You just keep it, okay, 30, 20 minutes. Once he gets to the point where he can kind of control himself, then you don't have to be in control. Now, the, the other thing is, too, is, especially teenagers, teenagers like to be in control of their own life. It's just part of being a teenager. Uh, and that means that one of the ways he is going to gain control of his life and not having you control one particular aspect of it is demonstrating his own self-control or her own self-control in that particular area. And so that's one of the things that, look, you know, if you want to be on your own, well, then you're going to have to show that you can be on your own. Um, but that's one of the things that you have, sometimes you have to sit them down and talk about. Sometimes, too, parents make the mistake of, of 
not doing a thing is not the same as being able to do a thing. In other words, taking the thing from them so that they can't develop the virtue doesn't mean that they're going to be able to be virtuous when they get around the thing. And so, um, like, let's just take alcohol, you know, if the kid binges one time and he drinks too much, the solution isn't to completely remove alcohol from his life, the solution is to sit him down and to talk to him about moderation, teach him moderation, and then yourself make sure that he sees that you're moderate in relationship to it, and then you restrict him to that moderation until such time as he starts to develop that. habit. But, here's the thing, St. Thomas says that virtue is voluntary. You can't develop a habit unless you want to develop the habit. If you don't want to develop the habit, the fact that people externally make you do it doesn't actually develop the habit. So, you have, the, the child has to want to develop the virtue in that area. Even if he feels his weakness or whatever, he has to want to be able to do that. And then, when, as you see him wanting to do that, it doesn't mean that he doesn't fall from time to time. It just means that if he wants to do it and you give him the right counsel and you do it and you moderate with him in the beginning so that he, and he wants to do that moderation in the beginning, um, then at eventually, at a certain point, that transition can be made where he's kind of, that he takes more and more control in that area. When, you know, remember when I said that Christ, you know, one of the biggest mistakes that children make in relationship to parents is exactly what I was talking about in relationship to Christ. People want to control things in relationship to their own perfection. No. There come certain times where you have to rest on your parents' control of a thing because you yourself have a difficulty in that area until you get on your feet. And then once you get on your feet, then the parents need to kind of start seeking the control more and more in that area. That means the parents on their side have to have detachment. But it also means that the child has to be willing to seek help from people who will help him get that control or help him to grow in that virtue. The idea that I just want to be on my own and develop my own virtue, well, that's exactly what this perfectionism thing is on relationship to Christ. So they have to be careful with that. But like I said, you don't want the complete absence of the thing to go on for very long because then you're perpetuating, actually in the end, you're perpetuating the vice. That's the real problem. So you have to start developing it slowly. And so when do you see that? You know, people always ask this question. Well, the virtue of prudence is knowing when to apply the general principle in the concrete. A lot of times the parents are more knowledgeable about the circumstances, so they have to know, okay, the general principles, we've got to get this guy moderated. So what do you do? You, um, the parents know the child's weaknesses in, uh, to some degree. They have to moderate it based upon his weakness and just moderate it there. And then as they see him starting to grow in virtue, they lighten up. I can't tell people exactly, okay, right now he should get X, because I don't know the person well enough a lot of times, people ask me. Um, sometimes, too, people, you have to be careful, because sometimes as a priest, people come in and say, Father, tell me everything to do, and then I'll just do it, and then I'll be perfect. Nah, that's not how this works either. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Age. Tell me about age as far as homeschool kids, and they're still home and all, and 18, you know, and up. It's, when do we... Oh, yeah, because yeah. a lot of times it'll be, you know, well, I'm 18, you know, I'm, yeah, sure. you know, and... Which means you should be responsible and quit acting like an idiot. Good. <laughs> so, this is, this is the general, this is the general principle. <laughs> from the ages of one to six, or when the from child, from five to six, and this is, these are, these time frames are fluid. From one to six, this thing's not working now. Um... From one to six, <coughs> they don't have use of reason. So, virtue is basically reason. You're following right reason. Well, the child doesn't have it, so he can't develop virtue. So, in this particular case, everything in relationship to the child has to be on level of command. The second thing is it all has to be, the, on a psychological level, you, train, train, you teach him what's right and wrong based upon association. Now, what does that mean? Aristotle says... Because children do not understand that something is good or evil, they just think that this chocolate tastes wonderful, so they're going to sit at that box until it's all gone, right? Because they don't understand, yeah, but then there's consequences of this, and you're going to feel sick later. Um, because they don't understand, you just have to associate pain with bad behavior and pleasure with good behavior. So... And then it all has to be done by command. Don't eat the fruit. If you eat this, or do, don't eat the chocolate. If you eat this, then I'm going to punish you. So that's what you have to do. You have to build up that association. That association is those building up the associations with morally bad behavior, with physical pain, and the 
uh, good moral behavior with um, with uh, reward, etc. Which, by the way, if you never reward your kid, is also going to end up a mess. But if you do those two things, what happens is that becomes the fa the psychological foundation for the later moral development. If you don't have it at this age, what's going to happen is it becomes much more difficult for the child later because they don't have the natural built-in psychological mechanisms of avoiding certain things that are bad. Right? Then from roughly six or seven, depending on when the child reaches the age of reason, until 10, 12, depending on the particular child, as they go through puberty, this stage there, it has to be primarily, the, it's primarily on the side of command still, but this is when you start giving reasons for the bad behavior. People who sit a kid down who's tears old, Johnny, you shouldn't hit people because, see, you didn't like that, Johnny, and so other people don't like getting hit, and so that's why it's bad. The kid doesn't have a clue what you're talking about. The person who needs to be spanked is the adult, because you're that stupid. <laughs> So, but, has to, but once they start having the use of reason and have acts of conscience, which occur sometime between the ages of four and six, for most children, once that happens, then you have to start giving them the reasons for that. No, it's bad because it makes you more bad, and you'll develop, you know, and you, this is the stage where you start talking about virtue. Do this over and over again, and you become more virtuous. And during this stage, they can start developing the virtue... But it doesn't become perfect yet because they don't have full volition yet. Once they go through the age of, you go through puberty, which is anywhere from 10 or 12 to uh, 18, they're still technically speaking under you on the side of command. I'm not having too much luck with these things. Um, they're, still on this, they're still under you on the side of command. So... They're still on the side of you, on the side of command. They still have to obey you. And through, from before 18, they are bound by, because God said you must obey your parents, they must, they must obey their parents. And if they don't, it's sinful. Uh, except, obviously, if your parents tell you to do things that are sinful, you have to obey God rather than men, so to speak, as St. Paul says. But at this level, it should really be as a matter of reason or counsel you have to continually give them greater depth of understanding of why things are wrong and why they should be done. And the only time that you, the command would take any kind of precedence is if the kid is acting like this. You know, like he's one or six years old. Or he's acting very immature. That's when you start commanding them more and clamping down on them more. But you, should, but you have to, your goal is to get them to the point where, um, because after the age of 18... All of the moralists say he is no longer bound under you in obedience. He is bound to do your bidding for the most part, they say, because of honor. What's that honor? Honoring you as their parents, the excellence that you have as being their parent. And so he must honor that because that excellence is a reflection of God and he must honor God. So once you reach the age of 18... You have to do what your parents ask you, normally speaking, unless there's a sufficient reason to the contrary. Then you don't have to do it. Whereas when you're bound under obedience, you have to do it unless it's morally, unless it's sinful, sorry, just sin sinful. Now what about the kids who live at home? Uh, therein lies a different dynamic. After the age of 18, it's true that you don't have to obey your parents because of the precept, How? because they're your parents. <laughs> You have to obey them because you're living in their house and it's their territory and the father and the mother have rights of disposition over the home. And if you violate that, it's a sin of justice against your parents. Um, it's like anybody else. If you go and live in someone else's house, as a matter of justice, you must obey the policies that they set down for the house. And if you don't do it, it's sin. It's just, it's not a matter of obedience. It's a matter of justice now. Even though obedience is also under justice, it's a direct justice. So that's how that works. So, and they say, well, I'm 18. So, <laughs> as long as you're living in my house, you go to church every Sunday, and you're doing this, and you're doing that. Okay. The haircuts include... Parents have to be careful not to, once the kid reaches 18, to mother them or father mm -hmm. them to death. Mm -hmm. So, the answer is, 
Unless the haircut is causing problems with the other kids, I would say no. Like if, you, if you've got some kid in your family and his hair is down to his shoulders and he's 18, you're like, cut that thing off. <laughs> right? If you're going to live in this house, you've got to cut the thing off. Mm-hmm. Because we don't want, you know, your brother Johnny thinking that he should look like a girl too. <laughs> On the other hand, you don't sit there and say, you know, really, I, I, I think that you should have this kind of haircut and that kind of... <laughs> that's a motherly thing. You do that, you know... Down here. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. This is um, more than a question, I guess. Maybe you don't want to get into it now, but I'm thinking of a case where these grandparents of little children, mm-hmm. and their parents aren't doing, uh, they aren't um, dealing with them right. the way they should. Um, I guess the question is what is your responsibility, and you know, do you really have any? Uh, The natural law states that the children are directly under the parents, that it's the parents who have the natural law right to educate their children and to form their children. The grandparents do not have the direct right over those children. They do, however, have an indirect responsibility to them by telling their children, you better be doing X. Now, that doesn't mean from time to time you can't kind of form the kid in something that <clears throat> the, parent, the, grand, the parents are kind of failing in. It just means that ultimately your job is to get the parents to come up to speed. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. And about their home, like if the, if the child's in their home and you said the rules of your home. Yes, like then they have the to. They're teacups across the Yeah, no, no, then they have, right, they have to, no. Once somebody lives in your home because it's your domain, so to speak, you have authority over your home, they have to obey that or you kick them out. Regardless of whether grandchild or what have your child over 18. So, okay, yes. And that, that also applies to employer employees, right? I mean, employees need to yes. obey the set yeah. rules. Yeah, the, right. So in relationship to the fourth commandment, even though the fourth commandment deals with honor thy mother and thy father, it also means that, we, that <clears throat> it's the one that deals with piety. So we have to honor those people who are above us. So when we work for somebody, there's two things that has to be observed. The one is the right order, so that basically we do their bidding. You know, unless we know that the person, if they knew better, would say no because this is going to cause, you know, gargantuan financial loss. But um, the normally the, 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 it's a matter of the order because the, because the employer has um, authority over it that they have the rights. The second part of it is, um, which is something that you see a real problem today. They did a study and they found out that 80% of people, although you wouldn't have this problem on a farm so much, but they said that 80% of people who work in an office spend anywhere from 15 minutes to two hours a day doing personal things on the computer. The church used to say that's a form of theft. If the employer is paying you, as a matter of justice, you have an obligation to put in a few pages for eight hours, you have to have to put in eight hours of work. If he's putting it... it um, um, and that doesn't mean that, you know, because normally, like in our culture, at 10 o'clock, everybody gets to take a break. If you're doing something really exhausting, and you need to say, okay, look, I, I'm not going to be able to finish this unless I take a couple-minute break, that doesn't mean that you're somehow violating the rights of the employer. You're just making sure you're going to be able to get this done. Otherwise, you're going to, you know, pass out or something in the, in the Alabama heat or something. But the point is, is that you have an obligation. So it was a matter of justice to, um, as a matter of financial justice, to, to make sure that you did the eight hours worth of work or what have you. The second side of it is is honoring their um, the right of disposition of the order within the thing that's under their authority, um, and so if we do that, um, the other side of it though too is is that I think as employees, as employers, and employees, and I learned this as um, being a priest, you can't. And when you're in a parish, you have to be careful not to. Uh, control the employees like you do your children under the age of six. Because, you, and you just have to recognize the fact that there's always going to be a certain amount of lack of adherence to what you tell them to do with exactitude. That doesn't mean that you don't keep encouraging them to do it, it just means that it's, it's, the, it's, it's the same way that God treats us. The minute we commit a sin, it's not like God, wham, hits us. Because why? If we did, it would fulfill the the observation in the book of Proverbs where it says, 
Fathers, don't nag your children, lest they lose heart. Eventually, if you're constantly at them, it's like, I can't do anything right. right? So you have to be careful with that side of it. The other side of it, though, is, is that the, um, is, um, um, you have to be careful with you know, recognizing that you know, if they don't do everything perfect, that's just the nature of hiring people. The second, because we're not perfect. I mean, you know, before Adam and Eve, had they not fallen, we would all have been perfect. The second flip side for it, though, is, is um, being detached yourself so that you, if your employees don't do anything right, it doesn't disturb your interior peace. But you just seek to do, make sure that things are done properly. Um, and then, and like I said, on the side of the employers, you just have to also recognize that your employees, your employer isn't, on the side of the employees, your employer isn't necessarily going to be perfect either. So you have to kind of put up with their defects and their imperfections. And if you find that they have a defect or imperfection and it bothers you, well, then you know where, what virtue you need to work on. So um, I think it's just a matter of if everybody is trying to work on virtue, then it will happen. But that main, the main thing on the side of the employees is the justice and then also honoring the person's authority, legitimate authority. You know, in the past 50 years ago, this or not 50 years, maybe 100 years ago, it was so ingrained in our culture that the employer, you had to honor the employer. Um, I mean, you may not like him, you may not like but you just had to do that. And you had to put in a just amount of work for the wage. It was just part of our culture, but this stuff is just all collapsed. Um, you still can find them. Actually, I find it kind of ironic because I find that um, there's certain pockets in the country where people are just, the culture is still kind of there, and so people are more naturally inclined to do those things. So... Yes. Uh, what do you do when, like, in an employer-employee situation, what do you do when, uh, say, the employer gives one of the employees uh, charge over something to dictate mm -hmm. how some things go with it, but say they teach all the employees a certain way they want things done, Right. and when the employer who's in charge of that say, no, 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 don't do it that way, do it the way I tell you. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, the f obligation is to do it the way the employer says, but if the employee sees something wrong with it, you know, it's kind of like Jeff the other night was telling about the, you know, starting up the uh, cement plant when there wasn't people and people go running off, you know, it's not a good idea, you got to tell him, look, it's not a good idea to do this before midnight because all these guys are going to leave, you know. Sometimes you have to go back to the employer and say, well, look, we, maybe it would be better to do it this way or that way. Um, or get clarification. But it, like I said, that just has to do with the order. The other thing is, too, is I think as employees, and I've kind of, I kind of learned this uh, when I was a priest, is uh, under another pastor is, you know, he was in charge, so I just did what he said, and I just had detachment from it. You know, if it didn't work out perfectly or if it wasn't the best thing, well, then I just didn't worry about it, you know. When it's under my charge, then I worry about it. But when it's not under my charge, I don't worry about it. So, when, in fact, one of the beauties of being an employee is you don't have to worry about it. So, I just don't worry about it. Okay. Yes? I was just going to say that as an employee, I, I look at the work that I do as, mm, you know, it's pretty good at my uh, employer's benefit, but, but the work itself is a, a dimension of honorability to it. That's correct. Being a good employee is an honorable thing, and people, and even today, people still want a good employee. You know, and you spend, sometimes employers spend long so much time to find a good employee, and when they find him, even if he's not perfect, they're like, okay, we've got to hold on to this guy, because he's always going to do the right job. Um, the other side of it is, too, is there's a virtue of diligence. Diligence is the virtue in which you, um, it's the opposite of sloth, where you apply yourself well to the thing. So even if, you know, when the employer asks you to do something, you develop virtue by doing it well and by doing it, you know, the way he wants it, it you know, etc. You develop that virtue through that process. So even if the employer tells you, you know, okay, today I want you to move the rocks from here over here, and you're like, okay, so you move them over here, and then the next day he's like, okay, move the rocks back over here again. You know, the fact of the matter is, the fact that he's telling you to do something that's ridiculous, I mean, you might want to say, oh, by the way, I don't think this is really financially efficient. That's one thing. But the fact of the matter is, is that it doesn't really matter on the side of the employee. You get to develop the virtue of diligence if you just consistently do these things. And you shouldn't take the, you know, in other words, you develop the virtue by just be, by working hard. And that's true for everybody, you know, not just the employees. That's just true even in our own personal lives that when it comes to taking care of our own, uh, our own property and things like that, that we're diligent, that we work hard and, and making sure that we do it well. So there's a virtue. In fact, the honor 
comes from the diligence, ultimately. But that, like I said, that's why you can usually tell, you can usually tell, even if your employee's like barking at you all the time, you can usually tell your employee likes you because he's keeping you around and he doesn't want to see you leave. <laughs> so even if he's like, rah, 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 okay, you just don't take it personally, realize that's that guy's problem. Okay, the boss has a problem with barking. Uh, we'll stop there. She'll do, I'll give you a blessing. Benedictio Deo Omnipotentis Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti Shinit Supervos et Maniat Sem.